Okay, Fred, uh, for your information, your CO2 reading on board is a little higher than what we're reading here on the ground. And so when it gets to 15 on your meter, switch to secondary. And uh, we'd like to get a status uh, about every 30 minutes. We'll give you a call on that. Uh, but uh, just to let us know we're still thinking about you, we'd like you to go bio biomed right, please. Okay, going uh, biomed uh, right. Square, Fred, help me. We're still here, Fred. How's it going? Say again what it is. Oh, just uh, just below uh, 13. Okay, just below 13, and uh, just for your information, uh, we've got uh, people working on uh, several subjects. We're working on the uh, mid course coming up. Determine. Uh, our control system and uh, how to do it with the control system we uh, select what we should do about the alignment we've got the LMS and uh, a couple of crews cranked up working on that and uh, we're also working on our entry how and when we ought to uh, activate the CSM and uh, we're working on the CSM systems uh, status uh, tomorrow sometime we're going to have a main bus B checkout. So uh, we've got a lot of people uh, swinging pretty hard here, and I've got some uh, f-stop settings for you for the uh, lunar surface camera at uh, 1 250th. We'd like you to take targets of opportunity. Each picture uh, use three f-stops because we don't know exactly which one is going to work the best. So we use four, five, six, and eight. At 1 250th with a surface camera. Copy. Okay, use the surface camera. Uh, at 1 250th, uh, 4.5.6, and uh, 8. And I've been doing quite a bit of shoots. Uh, I've covered two of those numbers in a range of 5, 6, and 8. And also the shoot some at uh, level. the last part, uh, maybe when the comm gets a little better, you can say it again. Okay, how do you read now, Jack? That's a lot better, Fred. Okay, I just said uh, the moon is uh, still so uh, bright that I think uh, probably the higher range rests up Okay. I can just uh, barely on the left corner of the moon now uh, make out the uh, foothills of uh, Rob Morrow Formation. Never did uh, get to see it when we were in closer. Okay, I'm uh, reading on my monitor here, Fred, that you're uh, 16,214 miles 
away from the moon, moving at uh, about 4,500 feet a sec. Okay. optimistic. Uh, looks like we're on the upside of the whole thing now. procedures for that. Uh, Ken's been doing quite a bit of work on uh, getting ready for entry. Very good. Okay, now that we're on the air, I should say we have with us this morning, uh, members of the white uh, flight control team, uh, flight director Gene Kranz to my left. I'll turn it over to Gene at this point. Uh, we've got, uh, at your request this evening, uh, Tony England over here to talk to you about how we intend to use some of the uh, command and service module lithium hydroxide canisters. We've got Bill Peters, the Telemu, who's the man responsible for the uh, uh, electrical and the environmental systems, instrumentation systems in the LEM spacecraft. And uh, Dick Thorson, who's responsible for the LEM control systems, propulsion, RCS, and uh, certain of the guidance systems. Uh, we picked on, up on shift at uh, about 74 hours and 30 minutes elapsed time. The uh, majority of our work for the first few hours in the shift was associated with it. Uh, modifying the crew checklist uh, for the doctor's burn we performed later at 79 hours and 30 minutes roughly. And these were lists that we had developed actually for a uh, lunar orbit insertion abort. Uh, and as such, the majority of the checklists were available in the control center for a lunar orbit insertion type contingency. And uh, our primary problem in modifying these checklists was to make sure that we used the minimum power uh, to accomplish the desired maneuver, as well as to uh, make sure that we put them in uh, proper sequence so that we didn't have any unnecessarily long power up. Uh, at around uh, 75 hours, we got into a relatively long discussion of passive thermal control, and I'll come uh, back to that later on. And as soon as we completed that, we went into a uh, uh, review of the uh, mission roles with the uh, flight crew. Now, we actually had a uh, very short review when we uh, talked to them about some of our uh, guidance and control type rules, uh, rules we use for attitude and rate deviations. Uh, during the period of time, we were reading, up, reading them up their uh, contingency checklist changes. Later on, we came through with a uh, relatively uh, detailed checklist update. This took uh, just about 45 minutes to get the uh, checklist information up to the crew. 
Uh, at around 75 hours and 45 minutes, we had uh, provided uh, the spacecraft, the state vector, and the target load for the uh, mid-course correction maneuver we were performing. And we went through a consumable status, and I'll come back to that later again. At uh, 76 hours and about 30 minutes, we went over the uh, uh, rules with the flight crew. Again, the, uh, uh, we were being very conservative on this particular burn because I think you were aware that uh, if we did not perform the burn, uh, we were on a free return trajectory and would splash down in the Indian Ocean at around 152 hours. So we wanted to uh, set the limits for the crew monitoring of the burn very tight. In other words, we had to have a uh, nominal performing descent propulsion system in order to uh, initiate and continue the burn, and if for some reason uh, the descent engine should start deviating in performance, we wanted to shut down the burn. Now, we were doing this primarily because we could make a small mid-course correction sometime later on uh, in the mission and bring us back to a free return trajectory again. So we played that particular maneuver very conservatively. Uh, I believe you've probably got a transcript of the air-to-ground communications at that time, so that I don't think there's any need to go through uh, all of the rules we read up to the crew. Now, one of the items that was of concern to us as we entered the burn was how good was the platform orientation. And uh, we made uh, two checks, uh, one looking at the sun, and the other one, uh, that's using the... Uh, AOT, and the other one, immediately prior to the burn, where we were looking for some kind of a bore sight to make sure we were in the right attitude for the burn, and fortunately we happened to find that the moon was on the commander's LPD. So uh, through these two checks, we felt that we had a uh, very good uh, platform alignment, and we had had almost insignificant drift on the platform from the time that we originally oriented it, uh, just prior to the time we left the command and service module. Uh, I'll talk to you briefly. We reviewed at around 77 and a half hours, we reviewed the power down checklist, and as you're aware, much discussion ensued in getting this up to the crew later on. But our basic configuration gives us a low bit rate telemetry from the spacecraft. Uh, S-band voice from the spacecraft. We've got a uh, coolant loop up and operating. We've got suit fans on. We've got a cabin refresh capability. Uh, we've maintained a RCS manual attitude control capability. And uh, we've got the caution warning system powered up in the spacecraft. Uh, at around 77.56, the S-4B uh, impacted. I have the precise time later on here. I'll look for it in the notes. And I believe you probably got that word. At around uh, 78 hours and about 15 minutes, uh, the crew started the powering up of the LEM spacecraft for the Doc Gips burn. The burn was scheduled, and I'll give you the uh, delta Vs. Uh, the burn was scheduled for 79 hours, 27 minutes, 38 seconds, ground elapsed time. And the X component of the burn was 833 foot per second, and the Z component of the burn was uh, 213 foot per second. Uh, an effective delta V was somewhere around 900 foot per second. The impact time, as we've got it from the site that was recording the... Uh, transponder on the S-4B was 77 hours, 56 minutes, 40.025 seconds. We gave the crew their uh, final target load and uh, state vector as they came around from the backside of the uh, moon at 78 hours and 19 minutes. And by this time, the crew was well into their activation checklist, and our electrical power main bus load was running about 40 amps. Uh, previous to this time, we had widened the dead bands on the digital autopilot to conserve some uh, reaction control system uh, propellants. And at about uh, take minus one hour, we narrowed down the dead bands and uh, 
kept the communications up so we could have high bit rate telemetry throughout this entire last hour to make sure that we had a really good spacecraft uh, for the maneuver. After, uh, at this time, we went around the horn and made our decision on the initial LEM spacecraft power dam, and we advised uh, all the flight controllers uh, that we would start with the power dam of the LEM spacecraft at around cutoff plus about 15 minutes. We again wanted to make sure we had a good spacecraft post burn, and uh, we wanted to let the system stable down before we started uh, powering down the uh, systems on board the spacecraft. We gave them a go for the burn at 79 hours and 18 minutes, and at 79.27.40 approximately, we initiated the ullage. Uh, the burn looked very good. Uh, in fact, it was an excellent burn. Our peak current during the burn was around 50 amps, and uh, the burn terminated roughly at 79.32. Immediately thereafter, uh, we gave the crew uh, their initial power down information to bring the majority of the spacecraft systems down with the exception of the communication system and the uh, guidance navigation system because we had to keep that up to initiate the passive thermal control. The crew spent about uh, 45 minutes getting into attitude for the uh, passive thermal control and about 30 minutes to allow the rates to damp out prior to initiating the roll rate. The uh, tracking in the burn came in at about uh, 81 hours and about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And the initial cut on the tracking said that we had had a uh, very good burn. Uh, preliminary indications were that we'd perform a mid-course correction five at around 104 hours elapsed time and the delta V would be between four and six feet per second. It may turn out to be something less than that by the time we get more tracking in this evening. Uh, we had a uh, long discussion on the uh, lithium hydroxide canisters, and I believe Tony can fill you in on uh, whatever questions you may have there. Uh, we got into the attitude for PTC at uh, about 81 hours. We gave the crew a total briefing on the consumables, and I'll summarize the consumables as they stood at around 81 hours, 24 minutes of last time. The electrical system we had 1,498 amp hours. Uh, this means that we must maintain an average load in the spacecraft of less than 24.5 amps. Uh, at the present time, we expected to be able to power down to around 14 amps main bus current. We're running somewhere around, I guess, 13. Is that right, though? It's running 12 to 13 amps right now, so uh, looks like we'll start making some money in the electrical power system throughout the night and throughout uh, the next day. From the standpoint of uh, water, we got 215 pounds usable. And some uh, broken communications, it has not happened yet. It seems we've got a good stable PTC. But if the communication should become broken, we may be able to communicate to them only uh, 50 to 75% of the time. So we gave the crew uh, gross procedures they could use for selecting the antennas for us to allow us to communicate with them uh, much more of the time. And uh, that was about it. We got off shift at around uh, 82 hours and about 30 minutes. Okay, why don't we open it for questions now. Please uh, hold your hand and wait for the mic. This gentleman over here. Um, Mr. Trance, can you tell us uh, uh, two things? Uh, there was a report of what may be some new venting. Uh, can you tell us about that? And can you tell us what sort of physical discomfort the crew is in at the moment? Uh, from a standpoint of new venting, uh, we had not been aware of any venting during our shift. As you're aware, we had some problems in establishing our passive thermal control, although we finally established it looks good, and we thought we the uh, problems in as much as we were using very low uh, thrust pulses on the RCS system may have come from the uh, uh, sublimator in the uh, LEMA spacecraft. So that is the only knowledge I had now. There may have happened something in a subsequent shift. Ooh. Did that, when did that occur? Just about the time you were changing it, I think. There was this report that they had okay. seen some, some new gas and they were asking them from here whether it was residual from the original thing or whether it was new, whether they thought it was new. About the majority of the uh, 
burn pre-burn type procedures and post-burn type procedures, and I believe Jim Lovell's the, the because he's man that he, uh, he's seems to be somewhat so much now. We're trying to work up some kind of a crew rest cycle right now to uh, give them all an adequate amount of rest between now and the possible mid-course correction at 104 hours. Hurts now. A couple of questions. How much better off are you on consumables tonight than you thought you might be uh, last night? And uh, secondly, what uh, does a flight plan call for in the next 24 hours? Uh, i answer your last question first. The uh, flight plan for the next 24 hours is basically going to be passive thermal control. Uh, minimum activity, and we're going to stay powered down as long as we possibly can. Uh, see, what was the other question you had? I'm sorry. I was wondering about the consumables uh, and how much better off you are than you thought you'd be tonight. I think that, uh, at least from my standpoint, I feel we're much better off than we were last night. I thought we'd have to uh, maintain our bus levels at about 14 amps throughout the rest of the mission, but it looks like we have a bit more flexibility in... I think tomorrow we'll have a much better hack on this because I think the key consumable now at the, at the present time seems to be water. So once we get a hack as to how much water we're going to use in a fully powered down state, then I think we'll be able to give you a good answer. But from my standpoint, it looks a lot better now than it did last night. Although, again, last night we had the capability uh, of coming back. We just got a better margin to work with more flexibility now. Carl Abraham. Can we have a rather detailed explanation of the tests that were run in the simulations with the lithium hydroxide canisters and a description of how this hose is being attached or will be attached to, to a canister and particularly what hose that is, where did it come from and what's going through it? I brought that and he brought you over uh, one of our canisters. No, we used to looking at the backside to uh, scrub CO2 out of the first atmosphere. Okay, I'll uh, talk more directly into it. Uh, we have a limited amount of lithium hydroxide in the limb, and uh, it would relieve a lot of the pressure on the environmental control system if we could use some of the canisters, lithium hydroxide canisters from the command module. So we. Actually, Jim uh, Corielli okay, over in uh, Crew Support uh, Division, who designed this thing, and I, it uh, does an excellent job. Uh, got, uh, what we do is we use the suit the loop in the limb, and this is the scavenging the, uh, hose, the, uh, the exhaust out. hose, if you will, from the suit. Uh, and we just put the lithium hydroxide system. canister on the end of it, and, and it's not so easy to fasten yeah. on there. Uh, we've used a uh, data card out of the flight plan to make a structure so that the, the, the plastic cover here won't collapse on the end of the hose. The canister itself is coated with Teflon and none of our flight tape would stick to it, so he designed sort of a, a, a grid system that goes around it uh, that uh, allows us to fasten things to it. And uh, we've had one of these running for about three hours over in the 11 foot chamber in crew systems, and it, uh, all and, uh, indications are that it's doing the job. I understand that we have about 16 cartridges in the command module, and each one will have a lifetime of about 12 hours. And we'll be running two at a time, one on each of the suit loops and the lamps. Uh, I have a number of questions about the test and also about uh, one condition in the spacecraft. Are we correct in assuming that they're still running at five and a half PSI in the spacecraft now? And what was the pressure and the, 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 the absolute pressure and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide at which you ran the canister tests? Uh, the canister test isn't complete yet, and the last I saw it was just building up. Uh, I'm not sure, I think it was 20 millimeters of uh, water pressure that we were uh, going to build up to uh, in the test, and we're not going to allow it to get above 15 in the, in the spacecraft. 
Uh, it's, the test isn't complete yet. It takes several hours. The other question is, is the, is the cabin atmosphere in the spacecraft now at five and a half? Yes. I believe that's right. Okay. It's close to 4.7. 4.7, 4.8. Right. That I think uh, probably the higher Dr. Kim. Better, uh, what is the humidity situation this and how do you control the humidity? The uh, limb has some water separators in, in the suit loop in the, in the lunar module and they're all working and they're separating the water and, and controlling the humidity properly right now. There's no problem with humidity. Mark Lou. Never did that. Get to see it when we were in close Gene, uh, you've always been recognized as the LAM expert. How would you, uh, how would you classify the, the, the LAM as a spacecraft that can get these men back to Earth? Would you say it's in good shape? And, and how is your confidence factor compared to, say, uh, uh, last night at this time? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, no, I, I forget when we got started. Uh, gee, I think back in Apollo 9, we first started looking at the uh, use of the LAM as more or less a lifeboat. Okay. And uh, fortunately, although the exact procedures do not tailor the exact case we've got, we had uh, looked at the utilization of the limb for an awfully long time. So we knew what the limitations were. We developed workaround procedures uh, wherever it was possible. Uh, I think the limb spacecraft's in uh, excellent shape. And I think it's fully capable of uh, getting the crew back. Uh, I think as we have found before, every time we put the LEM spacecraft to a test, it's always done much more than it was guaranteed to do, and I think this is a good case in point. What, was your confidence factor anywhere near this high last night, uh, about this time? Yeah, it, it was, uh, let me put it this way, last night I felt we were going to have a much trickier management problem in our hands. It is not the easiest right now, but I thought that the uh, overall management of all of the energy, the yeah, water, all the consumables right in the spacecraft were going to be uh, quite difficult. And uh, I think one of the things that was very pleasing to me this morning, uh, or when actually when I got on shift uh, around 12 o'clock, I guess it was, was yeah, that uh, is we were still running at relatively like high power levels, but our consumables rates had steadied down to slightly less than what we had anticipated, and we were also happy that we were pretty well off in the uh, RCS system. Yeah, so uh, that from that standpoint, I, uh, I think we have a tricky management uh, problem coming back, but I feel that uh, we've got a good handle on the situation and know how to manage it. Jack Joe. Right, and, uh, you described the crew as reasonably the uncomfortable. Right, what, uh, what is, uh, what's the discomfort besides maybe the, the tension? Is there some physical? Uh, no, I'd say that the uh, uh, primary discomfort would be from uh, trying to rig up some adequate uh, sleeping capabilities in the Lenin spacecraft. Uh, I, have not had the uh, opportunity. Maybe Tony can answer a question on that. I really haven't looked into that in detail because our primary job has been managing the systems and getting ready for this burn. But I believe it would be primarily in uh, getting those guys into a point where they can sleep comfortably in there while uh, somebody's moving around, using the communications, and making periodic checks in the spacecraft systems. Oh, you know, yeah, That's right, they could very possibly be. Yeah. I guess I ought to correct yeah. myself. Uh, if they're testing this canister setup, how are they handling this in the spacecraft at this time? Well, it's not necessary to put this in the circuit until sometime tomorrow. We're going on the second, uh, the secondary uh, canister in the limb any time now. The CO2 level is getting up near 15, and we'll have, uh, I believe it's eight hours. Is that right on the second yeah, we've got uh, three additional seconds status reports uh, come as one uh, uh, crew members are waking in the morning from the number right from the flight plane that's right in front of your flight plane. Uh, I didn't have any crew status reports in my shift. And, uh, the doctor did not indicate that they had any problems. So that was basically the status we had when I left. Oh, Gene, perhaps Dr. England, I'm sure y'all are 
uh, gave a picture of uh, possibly what life is like up there. Um, <laughs> kind of like for you to share it with us. Uh, are, are they, uh, uh, there's some confusion about where the astronauts were spending most of their time. Are they all huddled in the limb? Uh, what are they wearing? Are they having to dodge some foods uh, because of the, uh, the uh, salt content would make them crave water? Uh, this sort of thing. Any observations like that would be useful. Well, they seem to be spending one one fellow in the command module all the time, the two in the limb, the guy in the command module uh, should be sleeping, but these fellows are pretty diligent, and I, I'm beginning to sense that they're taking a lot of pictures of the moon and the earth, and uh, they're even doing some studies on some of the particles that are flying off the service module back there. Uh, I don't know whether that answers all of your, your question. I, 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 I wouldn't describe them as all huddling down on the limb. They're pretty busy. Yeah, but, oh, is <coughs> Are they dodging certain foods because uh, this would make them crave water, for instance? I don't know. I haven't heard anything like that. Jim? What bonus are they in? Do you know? Or constant wear? Well, we're doing the constant wear garment with that coverall. General. Uh, two unrelated things. Uh, one, uh, is there any way for the medics to know what their condition is? Is there any of them at any time in the biomedical hardness system? And the second thing is, uh, has anyone come up with a way of finding out what the cause of this explosion or accident is? Uh, to answer your first question, yes, uh, we're looking at Biomed data tonight on, uh, I'm really not sure, I think it's, it's Fred Hayes. And what we're interested in there is to uh, uh, just monitor his uh, condition as function of, uh, I'd say, a backup measurement of any possible CO2 buildup in the spacecraft. Now, we don't expect that, but we are well, monitoring it. The well, problem we've got there is that since we are connect, uh, operating the in a uh, low bitrate mode the with the spacecraft uh, on the Omni, we do uh, lose some uh, signal uh, margin uh, there. And if this turns and, uh, out to be a problem uh, later on in the evening, we'll probably switch the off the biomed instrumentation because what it amounts to it wipes out the rest of our other instrumentation uh, at the power levels we're at. From a standpoint of what's being done, to try and determine the cause of the explosion or whatever the problem was that happened in the uh, service module, uh, equipment bay in the, in the area of the uh, cryo tanks and the fuel cells. Uh, I really don't know, Jim. It, it's pretty much tough staying on top of our job without worrying about what happened many hours ago. Now, we are looking pretty deeply into the entire status of the command and service module, and we're trying to come up with uh, tomorrow, for instance, uh, we expect to read up to the crew more or less a standard configuration we want them to go to for all of the switches, circuit breakers, and everything in the command and service module. Uh, we're looking for a, uh, to see if we can uh, make a test to verify whether the uh, main B bus uh, has any problems associated with it. Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, we're spending a large amount of time looking at such things as reentry checklists and particularly from a standpoint of establishing a timeline for separation from the uh, uh, service module and subsequently separation from the LEM spacecraft prior to uh, coming into uh, our entry interface time. So the primary work we've got going in the command and service module is to make sure we've got a good one and uh, do whatever troubleshooting we feel may be necessary and then to really shake down those procedures. Gentlemen here. Uh, can you explain uh, this collecting of water they're doing in the plastic bags, where they're getting it, or what they're going to do with it? And yeah, I believe that's uh, they're collecting the water uh, for their drinking and food purposes from the uh, uh, service module portable tank. And uh, they're just using their normal procedures. Remember, they, they used to have this uh, technique they use for uh, separation of the uh, H2 that may be in the uh, tanks uh, from the water. So it's just normal water collecting procedures in the service module, or in the command module. Okay, let's take uh, Carl Abraham and then two more questions. We're going to have to break it. Mr. Chairman, get some sleep. We were told before the burn that. Uh, 
uh, two people would be in the uh, lamb and one would be in the command locker. And later on, I got a uh, part of a quote which seems to indicate that maybe that wasn't the case. This quote was, he's the only CMP that's ever witnessed a dip spoon sitting on the SN engine can, which would lead one to believe that uh, all three of them were in the lamb at the time of the burn. Yeah, this Looks is like a uh, interesting uh, item. Uh, yeah, all three crew members were in the uh, LEM at the time of the burn, and we had uh, computed our dips gimbal trim position for the uh, uh, man and the command and service module spacecraft, which caused the center of gravity uh, uh, movement that caused the engine gimbals to compensate for the fact he was in there. So. We saw that excursion, and then once we found out that, uh, yeah, we had a, a CMP in the uh, LEM spacecraft, we okay. knew why the excursion. Okay, let's take Arch Schneider. Oh, yeah, follow that before. Would you care to speculate uh, why all three of them got together in the LEM at that time? I think the third man wanted to see what was going on. <laughs> Arch Schneider and then John Harris were closing. In the discussion of food about mealtime, was there some fear of contamination of some of the food in the command module? Not to my knowledge, I didn't hear any. Tony, did you? The dough or the They were trying to find something that would use less water in the I saw. At the time that we were going into mealtime, we, as, as you were aware, were having some problems in establishing our passive thermal control, and that became an end in itself for uh, about a half hour period there. And uh, generally during that periods of time, uh, we hand over either to the assistant, generally to the assistant flight director, to uh, be following the normal course of the mission. Well, let's close it with uh, John Harris. Uh, what single factor, if any, has given you the most concern at this time? Gee, it's probably uh, one that... Uh, I'd say the one thing, uh, I if anything, is uh, bothering me is there a large amount of checklist changes we're making. That's why we're always trying to stay several days ahead of them and verify them in the simulators, because once you've got tried and true, tried and true procedures, you like to stay with them. And uh, I think we've gone through the major portion of the checklist changes now, so I think we're pretty much over the hump from that standpoint. Uh, it's always nice to be to be operating in a mode where you uh, use where you're actually using procedures you've used before, and, and that's a good way to be. Checklist. By checklist, you mean re-entry checklist? Does that mean the re-entry is giving you concern? No, 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 no. I'm saying all the checklist changes we had made up to date. Uh, from a standpoint of uh, discomfort, that was about the, the major item because I think we thought we had a good handle on how to manage the systems now and uh, how to go about making this burn. Uh, we had made long dock dip burns, for instance, uh, back in the Apollo 9 mission. So we were pretty confident of those procedures. Thank you very much, John. This is Apollo Control at 84 hours, 8 minutes. During the change of shift uh, briefing, Capcom Jack Lausma uh, kept up a fairly constant uh, stream of communications with Fred Hayes, who is on duty, uh, uh, who is on duty in the uh, command module, uh, in the uh, lunar module rather, and I uh, would like to re uh, recap for you some of the things that uh, were discussed uh, during that period of time. Uh, Lausma advised Hayes that the mid-course correction being considered at this time is a seven foot per second maneuver, which would occur at 104 hours. Uh, the other option, which... Uh, sometime when you're not too busy chewing on that uh, beef, how about telling us what the CO2 reads? Okay, I'm reading uh, 13, one, three. Okay, uh, looks like our reading is getting kind of close to yours. discussed uh, with Fred Hayes the options that we have on that mid-course correction at 104 hours, uh, the other option being to uh, delay the mid-course correction 
uh, if that were done, it would not be necessary to uh, stop the passive thermal control mode, which the lunar module is in at this time. Uh, and that is being considered, but no decision has been made. The uh, carbon dioxide levels in the lunar module were also discussed, and a procedure was uh, passed up uh, to Hayes for keeping tabs on the rising uh, CO2 level and for changing to the backup lithium hydroxide canister when the level uh, reaches uh, 15 millimeters of mercury uh, partial pressure. The uh, surgeon also recommended that uh, the onboard reading be used for this uh, indication. It was felt the onboard reading uh, would be somewhat more accurate, although we've been uh, reading about the same thing on the ground uh, as Hayes has been reporting from the spacecraft. And uh, at last report, the uh, uh, level of uh, CO2 was uh, at about 13. At one point, Hayes reported that the passive thermal control appeared to be degrading a bit, he said that uh, every time the spacecraft uh, rotated one complete revolution, the Earth would appear to be a bit lower in the window and the Moon appeared to be moving higher in the window. I believe you heard Hayes report later that uh, there may have been some sort of a wobble in the passive thermal control and that the uh, Earth and Moon were now back in the proper position in the windows. So that's another uh, area that we'll continue to watch. and. Uh, see how the passive thermal control mode uh, maintains itself. We've also had a communications handover, uh, handing over from the tracking site at Goldstone, California, to the tracking site at uh, Honeysuckle Creek, Australia.